Ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take a look at John's Gospel, chapter 10. Gary Stimmon is here to discuss the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And J.R., we've got a great discussion today uh, because in John chapter 10, uh, Jesus says this, I and my Father are one. Uh, you know, it's been said, J.R., that uh, the Gospel of John speaks of the deity of Christ perhaps more than any other Gospel. And in this wonderful 10th chapter, we have Jesus uh, proclaim, proclaiming himself equal uh, with and to and conjoined with the Father. But before that, we have a lot to talk about. Yes. So let's set the setting right now. It was winter time. It was December, uh, the 24th day of Keslev, or somewhere between the 24th and the end of the month, the first few days of the next month called Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. Verse 22 says it was in Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Now, Jesus had been to Jerusalem for the um, Feast of Tabernacles in September. Then he went out to the Jordan River where John had, had been baptizing, and he spent a few months there, October, November, a few weeks in December. He comes back then at Hanukkah for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacle, or the Feast of Dedication. And of course then he will go back in the 11th chapter, he will come back to Jerusalem again, uh, or that is to Bethany, to raise Lazarus. And then he will go back, uh, and it's just one day's journey down to the Jordan River from mm -hmm. Jerusalem. And uh, he will stay there then until Passover and time to come back for the final um, discussions and the crucifixion. So here we are, we don't know exactly uh, when he comes to heal or to raise Lazarus. But we know here it is at the Feast of Dedication, the 24th day of Keslav, mm -hmm. somewhere around our Christmas time. And he chooses this time <clears throat> to give uh, a teaching concerning uh, the quality of being a shepherd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And J.R., he goes on from there to speak of the idea of uh, shepherding. And to me, it's remarkable. Here the lamb is the, is the shepherd. Mm -hmm. and, and we're looking at, at shepherding from both perspectives. That is the perspective of the sheep and the shepherd. And it's just a remarkable uh, teaching. Yes. Uh, it's called in the King James a parable, but actually it may be more than a parable. You know, he is referred to in the Bible as the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. Then he's referred to as the Great Shepherd. And finally, the Chief Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And to me, the Good Shepherd represents his first advent. Mm -hmm. The Great Shepherd represents his work in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And the Chief Shepherd will return one day at his second coming. That's the second advent. We can see these, Gary, in, in uh, Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Of course, Psalm 23 is the favorite psalm of so many of God's people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this refers to the great shepherd during the dispensation of grace as he, as he takes care of us and is the great shepherd of the sheep. So here we have the Good Shepherd, and we can see this in Psalm 22. You know, Psalm 22 is the Psalm of the Cross. We have Psalm 22 opening with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there's so many neat things about Psalm 22 that could only be fulfilled at Calvary. And so we have this incredible story of the Good Shepherd, the Great Shepherd, and the Chief Shepherd. You know, yeah. Psalm 24, Who is this King of Glory? You know, who is this that rides into Jerusalem? I think, and by the way, he asked that question twice in Psalm 24. Mm -hmm. I think, Gary, he's referring to the first advent when they didn't know who he was. And then the second advent when he tells them he's the king of glory. Yeah. And J.R., the thing that impresses me about his teaching uh, of, as a shepherd is that if you look at the role of 
of a shepherd. The role of the shepherd is to be a protector of the sheep. The sheep are usually thought to, thought of as kind of, um, well, let's face it, sheep. <laughs> they flock together. They they don't think a lot. They're kind of dumb. They're kind of dumb. Yeah, and like the, they, people. The, <laughs> and there are there are wolves out there, and and there are men trying to steal sheep. Mm -hmm. And the shepherd has to protect the sheep. And and Jesus makes reference to, here to a thief. And is he talking about Satan here? I think so. Either Satan or the Antichrist. I think primarily Satan, because throughout the dispensation of grace. Uh, Satan has been the arch enemy of believers. And so here he talks about the, um, uh, the thief. He also refers to a stranger. Will they not follow? In other words, those of us who know Jesus, his personal Savior, hear the voice of the Spirit of God. And uh, he, there are a lot of things we don't know because we're kind of dumb like sheep. But at least we hear his voice. We know him. And you know, uh, anyone who has studied shepherding knows that the sheep do recognize whether a shepherd whistles or mm -hmm. rings a little bell or whatever, the sheep will follow that. Uh, goats, on the other hand, it is said, have to be driven. Uh, a, a goat herd uh, uses a stick and sort of drives these goats along, but, uh, but the sheep will follow their shepherd. And uh, here is a principle, uh, a spiritual principle, that foreshadows uh, all of the struggles within mm -hmm. Christendom yes. and, and the sheep following the shepherd. He talks about a hireling. He talks about the hireling who, when the wolf comes, runs off, mm -hmm. leaves the sheep. Yeah. But he says here, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now he's teaching in terms uh, metaphoric. Uh, he's teaching a proverb here. And the people don't understand. They come to him in verse 24 and says, How long dost thou make us to doubt if thou be the Christ? Tell us plainly. And so uh, Jesus is deliberately speaking in couched terms here. And yet he at least tells us he's the one who gives his life mm. for the sheep. And <clears throat> J.R., he chooses this moment, if you will, this, uh, this parable, <clears throat> this teaching. Uh, he, he chooses to place it at the Feast of Dedication at the temple uh, in wintertime. And so we have the confluence here of the idea of shepherding, the idea of uh, the dedication of the temple and the miracle of the lights and the oil. And all of this comes together in a re remarkable way. There's a metaphor working here that's just very, very deep. Uh, because <clears throat> just before we find out that this is at Hanukkah, uh, we find in verse 21 uh, some people saying, These are the words of him that hath a devil. Can the devil open the eyes of the blind? There's this incredible conflict going on right there at, at ground zero in the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jesus is giving this parable about uh, the one who will steal the sheep. And people stand up and say, this man's talking like a devil. And then the next sentence, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, which then brings us Talk about a scene, a beautiful scene. Yes. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Jesus is the shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And he will do so in the, next, in the following chapters in the Gospel of John. He died to pay the price on sin. Without Jesus, we have absolutely no hope whatsoever. And these poor people in the temple could not understand. They just could not comprehend that he was the great shepherd who was going to give his life for the sheep. And uh, so when they asked him, Gary, tell us plainly, he said, I told you and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And then he goes on to say, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So here's the security of the believer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In the hand of Jesus. He goes on further to say, my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then he makes this strange statement, I and to my Father are one. 
Gary, just what are the ramifications of such a statement? Well, let me begin, J.R., by saying I don't think the human mind can comprehend all the ramifications we have here. Uh, because we're talking about father and son, mm -hmm. yes, but if, if God Elohim is the father and Jehovah incarnated as Christ is the son, that's not as simple as it sounds, Yes. particularly if we, in other places in Scripture. Yes. Now, you know, Jesus has used parables and metaphoric language couched in these cryptic terms so that people could not comprehend or understand. And these people here in Jerusalem did not understand this concept of father-son. So when we return in just a moment, we're going to explore what that really means. So we must ask the question, um, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. What did he mean by that? Well, Gary, let's begin by discussing the, the idea that Jesus used metaphoric terms. Mm -hmm. And that these metaphoric terms, such as shepherd, does not mean that he goes around with a shepherd's staff. Mm. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't go out of the pasture and keep sheep, even in That's heaven. True. He probably doesn't even have any sheep in his backyard. That's okay? true, too. This is a metaphor for our weary minds uh, to be able to try to understand. Now, when he says, uh, in fact, when John says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. What does he mean, mm -hmm. Son of God? And Jesus said, uh, after this manner, therefore pray ye our Father who art in heaven. Well, in the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, there is no reference to God as being a father. This is rather strange. It is a yeah. New Testament phenomenon. The Father and the Son are, are very much New Testament. And, and let's start with the incarnation. Because you know, J.R., if you go back, <clears throat> for example, uh, to Luke, uh, the angel told Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, that's very easy for us to understand in one sense. God the Father is uh, placing the womb of Mary, his Son. Uh -huh. And yet... When we begin to investigate this, John, the Gospel of John, opens up with a word, uh, the word becoming flesh. And as I turn back here, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Now it begins to get a little bit blurry. If yes. the word was with God and the word was God, did the word then become incarnated as the Son? Or was the word the same as the Old Testament Jehovah? Well, you read from, uh, from the scripture there that said that the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, mm -hmm. and that which will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yes. So it was not God the Father who came to Mary, it was the Holy Spirit who exactly. planted the seed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is not the Son of the Holy Spirit, he is the Son of the Father. And so here's another head scratcher, just how does this work out? Well. In the final analysis, folks, uh, there is no human answer. We don't know what the truth of the matter is. Now, when I say truth, all, I know that what we have talked about, Jesus being the Son of God, there is a Heavenly Father and He is the Son, and there is a Holy Spirit, and I believe in the Trinity. Absolutely. I'm mm -hmm. not degrading that teaching. Yes. I'm saying that it is metaphoric. And uh, there's far more to it than we in our human minds can comprehend. You just cannot comprehend God. God has elements, and, and he seems at times to be able to almost to break himself apart into different uh, functions. For example, the lamb taking the seven sealed scroll. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> why wasn't it the Son of Man who took the seven sealed scroll? And is the Son of Man the same as the Son of God? And, and is the Son of God the same as the Old Testament Jehovah? And on and on it goes. And when you begin to meld all these terms together in your mind, J.R., you suddenly understand that God is vast beyond our comprehension. Yes. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes. And that's all we know to say about it. Right. Uh, in, for example, uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we have God sitting upon the throne, and the 24 elders fall down and say, Thou art worthy, for thou hast created all things. 
Well, now John wrote that. When we get back to his gospel, chapter 1, Jesus created all things. Mm -hmm. So how can Jesus be sitting upon the throne holding the scroll and Jesus shows up as the lamb as it had been slain. Yes. And then they sing, Thou art worthy, O lamb. For thou hast redeemed us. Indeed. When we get back to the book of Revelation, we have Elohim standing on the brink of eternity, and Elohim said, let there be light. So, is Elohim Jehovah or Yahweh? Is that one and the same? Uh, or is one the Father, one the Son? Mm. We don't. We don't know. We don't understand. All we can tell you is that Jesus spoke in metaphoric terms. No one of the people said in verse 24 of John 10, tell us plainly. <laughs> he says, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, Jesus had deliberately couched everything that he said in cryptic terms so that their eyes would be blinded, their spiritual eyes would be blinded. They could not understand that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited mm. Messiah. In fact, Gary, rabbis to this day claim that the Messiah is going to be a mere man. Mm. J.R., this takes me back to Deuteronomy 6.4. Uh, where, which is the pledge of Israel. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And you know that the one in that sentence means unity. Mm -hmm. The Lord is unity. Uh, he apparently has different aspects, but he is unity. Well, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. I believe he was using the one in a sense of unity here. In other words, we are the same thing. We are merged together in absolute unity in a way that you can't understand. Yes, and those people standing there could not comprehend what he said. So they took up stones to stone him. He says, what are, what are you doing? Why are you going to stone me? And they said, uh, uh, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods? <laughs> he quotes from the Psalms here Ooh. about the elders of Israel being called gods. Yes. And what he's doing is throwing back their same reasoning in their face because the rabbis were always nitpicking every little piece of the law mm. to make it fit uh, to their liking or to their thinking. Mm -hmm. So Jesus uses this classic rabbinical uh, way of looking at scripture and throws it back at them and tells them um, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture can be broken say you of him whom the father is sanctified and sent into the world thou blasphemest because thou said I am the son of God if I do not the works of my father believe me not but if I do though ye believe not me Believe the works that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I in him. Mm. The Father is in me, he said, and I in him. Wow. What we're talking concept. about the metaphysical. We're talking about the divine, which brings us to a, a subject that we can't leave without discussing. That is the fact that this is chapter 10 of John, and, and, and that's represented by the letter Yot, which is the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and J.R., mm. it speaks of the metaphysical and the divine. Yes. It's, it's not of this world. Furthermore, the Yot refers to the hand of God. Ooh. So here Jesus in chapter 10 said, talks about his hand and the Father's hand. So you wow. see, this chapter fits the meaning of Yot exactly. It does. Both in it being divine, metaphysical, and also uh, the hand of God. And we should say for those who have been watched, or who may be watching us for the very first time, that uh, John, uh, the Gospel of John, is outlined by the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, uh, which is a concept that if you haven't been familiar with, that you should, uh, you should follow some of the uh, work that J.R. and I have done, because you'll find it incredibly enlightening. The Yot, uh, the letter, J.R., that uh, speaks of the divine, this, when Jesus says, I and my Father are one, you just can't get any more, any closer to the metaphysical and the divine than that. Uh -huh. And in Revelation chapter 10, we have the corresponding chapter to the, to the gospel chapter 10, and we have this uh, divine being holding up his right hand, mm -hmm. and, the, and the scroll is open. 
And uh, so we have, again, the hand of God. Yes. And we have seven thunders that utter their voices. And John is told, write not the things that the seven thunders uttered. In other words, they are metaphoric and metaphysical and not to be understood before their time. And so we have the voice of the thunders and we have the voice of the shepherd in John's Gospel, chapter 10. Do you see how uh, the same subjects are treated in both corresponding chapters? And J.R., this uh, chapter uh, concludes on a divine <clears throat> note because they tried to grab him. They tried to arrest him, and, and he disappeared out of their sight. Yeah. He did it again, the great escape. And then, of course, he went out beyond Jordan, and he stayed until it was time to come and see Lazarus and raise him, which we'll look at in our next chapter.